Welcome to another edition of the Dog or Pass podcast. This for UFC Fight Night Lincoln Gaethje versus James Vick. I'm your host, Paul Shaughnessy, joined in studio, as always, by Cody Saftik. Off of our, I won't, I would, I don't want to say MMA cation because there's plenty of MMA during the little, uh, a little break in the UFC Solid action MMA. here. There was PFL, oh, yeah. there was Bellator, baby. There was a bunch of other things going on. So like we weren't. We weren't deprived at all, but there was no DraftKings action. Yeah, that is true. On any that of those true. things. You can't play any. No no lineups to be had for the last three weeks, but we're getting back into it now. Well, it's good that we have DraftKings back, no doubt about it. But the thing with that PFL card and the Bellator is it just seemed like if you had any ability to grapple whatsoever, for the most part, mostly on that PFL card, you were getting the victory. There was tons of money to be made. Uh, and now we come right back to UFC Lincoln where, hey, we got UFC back in town. But, geez, this is a tough card, Paul. So... Very looking forward to uh, breaking it down with you. All right, before we get to it, we have winners from three weeks ago. Jeez, long time. That we haven't announced. They actually should already have their money in their account right now. So uh, we have P. Frank, longtime fan of the show. Uh, You should have an extra 20 bucks in your account uh, as of at least right now. If you hear this and you haven't figured it out yet, money should actually already be there. And we have J. Lovelady, 25 Congratulations to P. Frank and J. Love Lady 25, your last or three weeks ago's winners. Enjoy the $20, but hopefully we give you some hot picks and you can make a little more money using said $20 to enter some lineups. So we have a, another giveaway this week, and I'm handing it over to you. How do, how do they win money this week? Well, the thing is, when you're looking at an MMA card, it's like, okay, what's a guarantee on this card that people can, you know, kind of give their answer towards? And one guarantee when you have Justin Gaethje on the card is that he will absorb a tremendous, he will absorb a tremendous amount of punishment. Uh, we've seen him get hit as little as 91 significant times and as many as 174. So I want to know, what is your guess? It doesn't matter if he wins or lose. <laughs> How many times will Justin Gaethje get hit? I would say in the head, but... Let's just go significant strikes total landed on one Justin Gaethje. Wow. I like that. It's different. It's different. And it's a random draw for anybody who doesn't know. So. Most people tend to not know, but all the same, just give your answer in the comment section with your DK handle, and hopefully you will win those free bucks. Boom. Let's get into the main event. We were just kind of alluding to it uh, with Justin Gaethje getting hit. Many times. More than anybody else in the division. That seems to be part of uh, James Vick's uh, promotion of the fight is about how... <laughs> Justin Gaethje likely has brain damage. But you have James Vick taking on Justin uh, Gaethje. 8,600 for James Vick on DraftKings. And he's a minus 150 favorite. Gaethje is 7,600 and plus 130. What's your take here? Listen, it's going to be a close competitive fight, I think. I don't think it's going to finish necessarily early. I think it's going to drag out. We've got five rounds to work with here. Maybe it makes it to that third. Maybe it makes it to the fourth. Both guys got married here. I see a lot of people going back and forth. Lots of people seem to like... James Vick. I do honestly see how his skill set can get him the victory here. But you can't sleep on Justin Gaethje. I think we know that. You know, the guy is a human highlight reel. He brings the pressure. He tries to break you or he himself gets broken. We've seen in his last two fights that he himself got broken. But when you look at Eddie Alvarez and Dustin Poirier, these are two of the top five lightweights in the entire world. And I'm not saying James Vick's not at that level, but we've got to be careful giving him favorite status here and then, you know, backing him and putting a bunch of money on it. The, The two ways I see this playing out is Obviously, being six foot three and having that range, that's going to be a problem for Justin Gaethje. Justin Gaethje typically stands right in front of his opponent, and he don't mind getting hit. A lot of the time he's standing at bay, Paul, he's not doing anything. He absorbs the punches, tries to counter. That's not going to bode well whatsoever against James Vick. If you look at the 20 career opponents that Justin Gaethje has faced, the tallest man he's ever fought was five foot 11. Most of his opponents generally fall into that five foot eight range. So taking on his first opponent above six feet is not only a big deal, but six foot three is a massive deal. So I see the jab working for James Vick. I see the the range working for James Vick, that length working for James Vick. But the flip side to that, Justin Gaethje is going to try to close that distance. And I think the leg kick is going to be a big, big, big problem for James mm-hmm. Vick. With taller opponents, we see this especially. The leg kicks are a problem. If you've got a shorter opponent comes out there and he kicks down, you know, he chops down that tree, so to speak. I know that's a cliche saying. But that's the way to get to these taller opponents, especially with James Vick, is that he likes to backpedal. He's a good counter puncher. And even though he's so rangy, eventually his opponents say, fuck it, I need to close the distance, and they'll move forward. So he's very adequate at moving backwards, backpedaling, and hitting them. <clears throat> but that's where you can steal some rounds against him. 
His last fight against Francisco Trinaldo, he's up two rounds. But in the third round, dude, he's just running away for the most part. I don't like to see that. I can see competent judges scoring the fight in the other direction because of that, you know, that a lot of that moving backwards. But also, I think you go down to that to that fight with Benil Dariush as a real indication of what someone who's aggressive, who's got a kicking game, who can enter the pocket and hit this guy. And you know something? We've seen James Vick. He's got a hell of a chin. We've seen him get dropped in the past. He got knocked down twice against Nick Hine, took them very well. The fight with Darius, you know, it's a short left hand, the first one that kind of discombobulates him, puts him down, he gets up, by all, you know, he, he seems like he recovers, but he gets rocked twice more in that fight and eventually obviously gets TKO'd. So that's someone that's aggressive. These other guys, you know, for the most part, they're trying to outpoint him from distance. They're not going out there and marching, you know, marching forward, closing the gap, pushing him up against the cage, working him, and that's all things that Gaethje can do. So I think the first couple rounds are going to be competitive. By the third and fourth, I just feel like that the leg kick game is going to start to pile up. All of a sudden, you're going to have James Vick, who's a more stationary target. And when you're tall and you stand straight up and you're worried about the leg kicks, so your hands start to drop, that's when that big right hand is going to come over the top. That's when a big left hand is going to stun him. I could see this fight going either way. I honestly could. But the name of the show is Dogger Pass. This is a fight that's very much, uh, to me, a 50-50 fight. Could go both ways. If you're going to give me dog money and Justin Gaethje, give it to me now. Because the odds seem to be coming a little bit closer day by day. So yep. if you like him, jump on him now. But don't quote me as saying James Vick <laughs> has no chance. He because the he's luck. built. He's, he's built to slap around a guy like Justin Gaethje. But I, I'm going to think Justin Gaethje gets back in the win column. And, and at 29, maybe he is starting to get a little brain dead, to be perfectly honest. But he's still got some big fights left in him. He's not completely shop worn. He's not completely done. You look at the fights with Poirier. You look at the fights with Eddie Alvarez. Lesser men fall down from those shots. And I'm not saying James Vick is a lesser man. I'm saying stylistically, I can see the merit to go on Justin Gaethje. So that'll be my pick. And the G, $7,600 on DraftKings. His his basement is pretty low, is pretty high, I should say. I mean, if he gets beaten, he's going down the third or fourth round. He's going to land a tremendous amount of shots yeah. in that those exchanges. Last point, sorry to cut you off. I know you haven't really said anything I much. I haven't said so anything. I know, so we got to get your point. People always say that I cut you off. I know. My, my absolute <laughs> last point on it is that Justin Gaethje has scored over 100 significant strikes in his last three fights. His three UFC appearances, he's scored over 100 significant strikes. James Vick in 10 pro UFC fights has never scored more than 91 significant strikes. So if you're looking at punch output, it's all Gaethje. Yeah. And for that reason, I think he doubles him up on the numbers <clears throat> and eventually he gets the victory. So that's the pick. It's like you read my, my play sheet here. Um, that's you have a, a play sheet? Well, no, I'm just <laughs> saying you read my playbook in terms of yeah. what I was thinking in this fight. Like, I, I know that Justin Gaethje has taken a lot of damage and he's gotten knocked out a bunch of times against top guys in the world, but... I think, yeah, I think he can compete again here. Um, he has kind of led people to believe that maybe he goes to some of his wrestling here. I don't think I really trust Justin Gaethje to, to follow a game plan like that. This guy's a warrior. This guy moves forward. But I think in doing that, he makes a tremendous DraftKings play at 7,600. This guy, win or lose, is going to be throwing up a bunch of uh, output, unless he gets finished in the first round, which is not out of the question. But uh, the last two guys that have knocked him out have had to put him through the ringer. Exactly. So does he get punched out in the first round? It's MMA. I suppose it could happen. But you take Michael Johnson's best shot in the first round, you eat it, yeah. and you just look at his performances. If you're going to beat this guy, you've got to pack a lunch and go to war with him. And I just haven't seen that from James Vick, so I don't know if he can handle it. Interesting that you do say that, uh, that you think this goes late into the rounds, because actually Vegas has... The uh, the under is getting steamed to the minus right now. It's minus 140 for the under two and a half rounds and uh, plus 120 over uh, two and a half rounds. So there's actually, there's value if you think it's going to go into, if we're going to see a round three, there's value in that play. Listen, only one of these guys has been finished before round three before, and that's James Vick, who got taken out in the very first round against Benil Darius. So if I'm betting the under, I'm betting Justin Gaethje to win the under. If I'm betting the under with James Vick, that's where I start to think. Yeah. If Vick's going to win the fight, he's going to have to do what Poirier did. He's going to move and backwards. And just style gonna, this guy. Yeah. There's also no denying that Eddie Alvarez has power. And there's no denying that Dustin Poirier has power. And I'm not saying James Vick doesn't have power, but he seems more of a submission guy. He seems more of a guy that's going to hit you he did with shovel hook crisp against, combinations. Uh, against Duffy. Jo Joseph Duffy, he knocked him out cold. First round, very close competitive round. Second round, competitive round, and he knocks him out at 459 of yep. the second round. So again, that fight that almost made it to the third round. And I do feel like Gaethje's a little more durable than Duffy. Duffy, again, not one of these guys that just goes to war consistently. And that's something that Gaethje does. I mean, you look at him in the World Series of Fighting, it's not pretty, dude, because he's getting lit up against Luis Firmino and Luis Palomino and even R Richard Petitionock landed some good shots on him. But... I just feel like in this spot, 
it should be the type of fight that Justin Gaethje should be able to prevail in. Regardless, though, you want you want action on this. If you're playing lots of lineups, like the fight doesn't go the distance prop is the highest. It's a five round fight. It's minus four fifty for fight doesn't go the distance. Like mm. it's very likely that even if we get to rounds four or five, like Gaethje has proven in the past that he's still throwing hammers at that point. Yeah. And if it gets to that, like he, there's such a high pressure, high volume at least with how he fights that. That he either gets finished. He, he, the guy always he he never goes out on his shield, right? He's 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 attacking the whole time. So uh, Gaethje is the prototypical yeah. DraftKings player. If he ends up winning, he's scoring like 120 points. Yeah, and, and and then just to add on to that, he's scoring that all with significant strikes because he doesn't actually complete takedowns. So yeah. let's say we do take his word for it, and let's say he realizes, okay, everybody's talking about how much damage I'm taking, and he's a stud wrestler. Don't get me wrong, this guy's former you know Division One All American. If he goes out there and does complete takedowns, he's not holding James Vick down. James Vick will just get back up, but we'll take those points for a takedown. Get five of them. I don't care because Vick will get back up, but at least he'll be scoring significant strikes and hopefully some points of the takedown. 7,600 seems like a steal, so uh, I'll be owning shares of him. Again, Same here. I realize it's a close fight. I think you're in the same boat and a very entertaining one that we'll uh, be gladly tuning into. We have Michael Johnson taking on Andre Touchy Feely. Michael Johnson is 8,700 on DraftKings, minus 130 favorite. Feely is 7,500, plus 110. Fight goes to decisions, minus 140 in this three-round fight between the two of them. Uh, money is actually coming in on Feely, um, or the line's moving that way. Uh, when I made the board, I make the boards like a day before, and then I update the odds before we come in here. It was like minus 150 or so for Michael Johnson, and now he's at minus 130, so... You're getting a lot uh, line value on Andre Feely here, but I, I I look at this and I go, what's his best best path to victory here? I think take he downs. can win a decision. But takedowns can, has to be. Can he get take or Andre Feely? That's his path. Got to get but, the takedowns. But is he a better wrestler than Michael Johnson? So fair enough. That's so, the question because on Michael Johnson, right, right. people forget. Uh, people were bringing it up during the the Khabib lead up, and like that's a different whole different ball game altogether. <laughs> Big time. And uh, they're bringing up the fact that he was like a junior college uh, wrestling standout. Blah 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 blah. Now I I think he's obviously gotten really good at striking. His uh, his timing's very good. Like the fight that he had against Edson Barbosa, like that he looked like a real problem in the division. But we haven't seen much of much of him like that since then um well he knocked out Poirier right after that you see yeah, here's sorry. a crazy thing about Johnson because he's got a terrible record as of ladies two and five yeah. in his last seven fights his wins are over Dustin Poirier he's had some and big Edson time Barbos. performances the losses Benil Dariush Nate Diaz Khabib Justin Gaethje the best. and to a lesser extent Darren Elkins who won the fight with the takedown that's what makes me worried about Johnson is that for as good as he is standing eventually these guys are tending to get him to the ground and when they get him to the ground uh, he just makes mental lapses and usually gives up the submission or against Khabib uses so much energy attempting to get back up that he tires himself out. It's a tough call though. Uh, I think Andre Feely based on the line value and everything like that is going to be super, super chalky I think on, on DraftKings. You have a 7,500 who's almost getting close to a pick -em. Maybe by fight time it goes down as a pick -em. That's the type of thing, but like, if he does win, do you really see him scoring big? That's the that's the big question. No, not necessarily. And the reason why I honestly think this fight comes down to the wrestling is that Michael Johnson is amongst the best strikers in the UFC. Ah, the you know I would say lightweight division, but he's actually a featherweight now. He's amongst one of the better strikers. The problem is, is that he doesn't necessarily tie his striking in with his wrestling. He's not the most elite level striker. You know, the guys like Nate Diaz will beat him, but the fact is he's got a tremendous amount of power. We all know that. The longer you stay standing with this guy, he's going to hurt you. Generally, guys start to reel. Generally, guys want to take him to the ground. Andre Feely's two fights ago, he takes on Artem Lobov. This is a walk in the park. Everybody in the UFC and their mama are calling for a fight with Artem Lobov because yep. everybody wants a piece of that action. It just seems like a winnable fight for the, the majority of the roster. So Andre Feely gets the Lobov fight. And one thing that I noticed is that Lobov's beating him in these striking exchanges. It's the fact that he's able to take Lobov down. In that third round, there's a moment where it's like, oh no, Lobov's coming on strong here. Feely looks like he's tired. Looks like he's a little bit... Uh, 
you know, weary-eyed. Maybe he's starting to get worried in here. But the takedown's just there for him. And as a result, he beats Lobov, no questions asked. The next fight against uh, Dennis Bermudez. I lost that fight because I went with Dennis Bermudez. The reasoning there was that Dennis Bermudez is a better wrestler than Andre Feely. He's going to keep the fight standing. And standing, Feely's got a couple flashy tricks in the sleep. He's got a nice little high kick. He's got a nice little straight left. He's competent, but he wants to ultimately get the fight to the ground. He he doesn't fit the mold of an alpha male fighter because he's a little bit taller than the rest of them, but the game plan is still the same. Box this guy up a little bit, try to get him to the ground. I didn't think he'd be able to get Bermuda to the ground, but he scores three nice takedowns, Paul. Yeah. I mean nice takedowns. And I'm going to go on record to say Dennis Bermudez is probably a slightly better wrestler than Michael Johnson. Fair so enough. the fact that he's able to take down Bermudez leads me to believe that he will be able to take down Michael Johnson. The other thing there is that he wins a split against Bermudez. There may Bermudez. be an element of surprise there, though. Most people thought Dennis Bermudez actually won that fight, despite it being a split decision for Andre Feely. So even if you think, well, geez, you know what? Here's him sticking to the game plan and taking down the wrestler. But also, did he actually win that fight? I don't know. And if you look at Feely, this guy rotates wins and losses. Win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. Beats Lobov. Should have lost to Bermudez. Fact is, this is the first two-fight winning streak this kid's been on in a long time. And now he's got to follow that up by going and getting that coveted third victory, taking on a tough guy like Michael Johnson. I don't know that he's going to be able to get it. The one question is, yeah. now the secret's out, though. Because, like, Bermudez was not going into that fight going, oh, I feel he's going to come and try to get takedowns on me. I didn't see it I guarantee uh, nobody did. Nobody yeah. was calling like, like that was going to be his path to victory in that right. fight. Now the secret's out, though. That may change things a little bit. That you know changes what? Michael Johnson's preparation no, for this no. fight, see, doesn't it? See, normally I would agree, but Michael Johnson's got fairly low ring IQ. And what I mean by that is that he generally makes lapses in judgment in the middle of the fight. Now, when you're fighting Darren Elkins, do you honestly think this fucking guy's going to stand with no. you the entire time? You know the game plan. The book's already out on Darren Fair. Elkins, and he boxes him up hard the first round. He beats Darren Elkins. But in the second round, there's that opportunity. Elkins commits to the takedown. He gets him down, and this fight is done shortly thereafter. Elkins not exactly known for high-end grappling. Great wrestler, really grindy guy. But the fact that you just give up your back against Elkins, he gets choked out, I don't like that. Could Feely get the takedown, get the back, maybe get a submission? Sure. Could Feely win the first two rounds and just stay alive in the third round? Because he is tough to knock out. I mean, Yair Rodriguez had to finger blast him and then kick him in the face in order to get the job done. The guy's got a pretty good chin. He's a pretty durable fighter. So if he goes up first two rounds on Michael Johnson, maybe he coasts out. But I honestly see the fight playing out as Andre Feely maybe struggles on those initial takedowns. Johnson gets the better of the striking exchanges. It's probably going to be a close fight. I do agree with the fight going the over, and that's minus 140, so that's something that I'd be very interested in. But fight goes the distance, and I'm thinking Michael Johnson gets the nod. So Fair enough. Again, this is a card full of close fights, yeah. and we're going to talk about that. But path of victory for, for Andre Feely is get those takedowns. Path of victory for Michael Johnson is sprawl and brawl this guy, and I do think that that's probably the better path. I'm going to take Michael Johnson. The 8,700, ugh. I yeah, think I can tough. find some better value. He's going to be value. low owned, I'll tell you that much. I think I can find some better value. Because we know how much power this guy's got, but I don't see that first round knockout materializing. I agree. I agree 100%. Let's move on. we got Angela Hill taking on Courtney Casey. Angela Hill is 8,500 on DraftKings and a minus 140 favorite. Courtney Casey, 7,700 and plus 120. Fight goes to decision. Minus 435. <laughs> Uh, I like Hill here. I think uh, I think she's the better striker. She's obviously learned a lot since like her time on the Ultimate Fighter in terms of sprawling and brawling. Yeah, uh, I think she's taking on better grapplers than Courtney Casey, to my like uh, Olivia Souza and and some other people Fair enough. along the way. Um, I think she's able to sprawl and brawl here. We saw Casey kind of yeah, lose to uh, Felice Herrig on the feet. It was a very, very razor close fight, but like- Close fight, Michelle Watterson fight was very close too. Yeah, and she's always in close fights. I think Hill is the better striker here. The only question in terms of like the fight going to decision, now we're looking at DraftKings, we go, is Hill gonna get enough volume in this fight to even warrant rostering her. And that's the real question. Her last two fights, she scored over 100 significant strikes and she's paid off a, a, a yeah. pretty amount as far as DraftKings points go. So yeah, if you think she's going to go out there and style on Courtney Casey Sanchez, then she could very, definitely get that value. Sanchez has been in some wars before. She fought Felice Herrig. That fight, except for outside of one takedown late in the first round for Felice Herrig, generally took place standing. She outstruck Felice Herrig in all three of those rounds, loses the decision. So here's a striking match that on paper, she's actually outlanding Felice Herrig. Her hands are really not all that bad, but she loses the decision. So you go from that to the fight with Michelle Watterson, who you're twice the size of Michelle Watterson, and this girl's taking you down. 
Now, she threatens all of the submission attempts off of her back, but for the most part, Michelle Watterson's on top of her and she loses yet another split decision. It's really easy to now look at this girl's record and think, two fight losing streak, both by split decision. Eh, I think Angela Hill gets the job done, but I think there is some merit on Courtney Casey. I, I like a lot of the favorites in these spots. Angela Hill is likely going to be my final pick, but I I'm also kind of leaning towards a pass on this because Sanchez, first and foremost, is much, 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 much better on the ground I think than Angela Hill. By Casey now. Pardon? I think there's trouble in paradise. I think she just goes by Casey. Well, I think they're still married, but she just kept her maiden name. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know what it is. But okay, let's just call her Courtney Casey. Courtney Casey is better on the ground than Angela Hill is, but Courtney Casey does not commit to takedowns. In fact, she has not taken down an opponent since Christina Stancio. Your girl, just joking. I know you all used to rib on her. <laughs> um, outside of that, dude, she doesn't take girls down. She had to rely on R Ronda Marcos taking her down to get the submission. And for the most part, she just wants to stay standing. I think she's a better technical boxer than Angela Hill is. Her problem is, is that she's very slow, she's very plodding, and she stands right in front of you. So girls that are a little more athletic than her, that cut mm -hmm. angles, they can move around, and they'll just beat her to the punch. And Angela Hill should be able to just piece away at her. The one thing that gets me with this fight is that mental toughness, I'm going with Courtney <coughs> Casey. This girl's big. She's rugged. She's five foot seven. She trains out of the MMA lab, which is known for you know their durability and that mm -hmm. that type of style that just allows you to keep marching forward. With Angela Hill, she's more of a finesse Muay Thai fighter. She likes to move a lot. She likes to stick a move and you know pop out that jab, pop out that right hand. But look at the Nina Ansarov fight. Nina Ansarov is kind of matching her with striking totals. And there becomes a point in that fight where you know it's still within a realm of possibility for Angela Hill to turn up to that next notch and win this fight. But she allows herself to just get bullied a little bit by Ansarov. And I feel like Casey's going to be able to do that. Casey did not fight poorly in her last two fights against Felice Harry and Michelle Watterson. She just comes up on the short end of a, you know, a split decision. This fight, if it hits the ground, which I don't really think it's going to hit the ground, it's going to be Casey's wheelhouse. If she's on her back, sure. she's better on the back. If she's on top, she's got a good shot of maybe submitting a girl like Angela Hill. If it stays standing, yeah, she's probably going to get hit more, but she'll do more significant damage. She doesn't do damage. much on the feet, is that's the problem. So she's got to get. I feel like I feel like she, she gets hard for the division. When she scores big on DraftKings, is because she's got the fight to the ground, and and she finds the submission like she did against uh, like Marcos. But uh, she she scored ninety one significant strikes standing against Felice Harry. Right? Really? Yes. So that fight, in, in, in the second round, she lands 31 significant strikes. In the third round, she lands 31 significant strikes. In the first round, it's like 28. So her output actually sits pretty consistent. She doesn't really seem to have cardio issues. I know back in the day, like the Calder would fight short notice. She gasses out. She didn't look fantastic in her early run in the UFC. And you know what? She doesn't look fantastic now. But those type of durable fighters are going to give people problems. And a card full of favorites that we like favorites. Angela Hill's the kind of person that eventually has these moments where she don't look as good as we're giving her credit for and you know maybe Courtney Casey is going to be one of those girls that as an underdog here plus 120 not exactly giant odds by any stretch a anyways like I said to start off this little breakdown I'm kind of leaning towards Angela Hill just because I think she gets the higher numbers and will win a close decision but it's largely kind of a pass for me I think I avoid this fight on DraftKings I think I avoid this fight on the money line if I'm going to bet anything it could be the smallest little sprinkle on Hill by decision but I see the danger in Casey, and I don't know that I want to fall into that trap. Next up, we got Brian Barberina taking on Jake Ellenberger. Brian Barberina is 9,500 on DraftKings and a minus 490 favorite. Jake Ellenberger is 6,700 and plus 390. Brian Barberina by, by knockout is minus 137. Fight goes to decision is plus 190. Um, Vegas is telling you that Jake is getting slept again now in front of... All of his hometown. It's not just Vegas telling you that. Pretty much everybody. <laughs> Pretty much everybody. Everybody is telling that's you that. talking about it is uh, pointing to the obvious. It's tough fact. to trust to trust uh, Jake Ellenberger at this point. It's obviously. nearly impossible. It's, a, it's basically impossible. But like, I think the line seems a little bit out of hand here. It's a Fair. little bit wider than than I would be willing to. Uh, I don't. It just smells. Just smells like uh, like the the apple pie. Is about to get shit up. And I've always been a supporter of Barbarino. We picked him against Sage when he was a big underdog. Um, yeah, he's I done I didn't good. see it coming against Worley Alves. The guy just digs deep. I had, I had him there too. Yeah, you yeah. did. Uh, the guy just digs, digs deep. He's a grinder. He's a grinder. We were talking yeah. about John Crouch in the MMA lab. Yeah. Like This guy is the prototypical guy from that gym. He's yeah. just super, super hardworking. He's a grinder. He's not flashy. He doesn't look the part of being like a jacked up fighter or anything like that. Yeah. Well, the guy's tough, but I, I don't know. Minus or f five to one just seems a little bit wide to me. Um, but 
I guess if you're playing lots of lineups, like you're going to need some Brian Barberina because Jake's Jake's chin, chin is shot. You look at a guy like Takanori Gomi, and well, he had five straight UFC losses, and then he lost one on Ryzen. He finally wins one against Melvin Gillard, who's also done fight losing in his career. But like some of these guys, it's just like they get finished. They get finished in the first round. If you don't have some of it, you're going to pay, especially in, uh, in big uh, DraftKings contests. So of the guys at the top of the board here, I think Barbarina, if I'm going to pay up for anybody, he's the guy that I am paying up for in DraftKings contests. But... Uh, Maybe Jake has one left in him. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not vying for it. I'm not trusting it. I'm not betting. Yeah. For Barbarina at my at five five to one. That's yeah, all I, I'm saying. I just feel like the one that he probably had left in the chamber is when they beat Matt Brown. Spectacular fight for him, and that he you know beats a very durable TKO is a durable guy like Matt Brown. But again, Matt Brown's soft in the body, and that is a body kick finish. And there's no denying that Ellenberg was rocked in that fight as he's rocked in most of his fights. His chin's just not there anymore. I think a lot of people point to the fact that here's a guy with good wrestling credentials, you know, a big right hand, athletic guy, used to be the shit. Maybe he can get back on track. But how many times do we hear people get lulled into Johnny Hendricks? Hey, this guy's a credible wrestler with a big right hand who used to be the shit. It, the times pass them by. The difference between the, ta- the difference between both of these guys, namely, Johnny Hendricks is a little bit better all around, but namely is that Johnny Hendricks can at least for the most part take a punch. Jake Ellenberg doesn't seem that way. And the wrestling's not even a factor with this guy. He does not shoot takedowns. I don't know what it is. He doesn't shoot takedowns. Mm -hmm. He took Mike Perry down once and Perry got back up, which is a little suspect considering I can't imagine he has a spectacular ground game. But all the same, it's, it's not him just getting beat. It's him getting beat in spectacular fashion. The Perry elbow to the face, one of the most devastating knockouts in recent memory and then following that with ben saunders again i pick ben saunders largely based on the fact that yeah he's not great but jake ellenberger is he's shot, shot. Yeah. i didn't see a body finish i honestly could not pred- have predicted that he was just going to knee him in the body and fold him but all the same that's what you get when you have a shot fighter he's on a terrible run right now clearly he's in somebody's good books because there's no way he should be even employed to the UFC. But he's from Nebraska. Let's give this guy one more fight. We happen to be in Lincoln. We're going to give him a fight that he shouldn't go out there and get punched out in 90 seconds. He could have a competitive fight with Barbarina. He is faster than Brian Barbarina. Let's get that out of the way. Brian Barbarina's slow, man. He doesn't really move Not a great athlete, but he's... Not uh... a very good athlete. He kind of just moves forward and looks to break you. And it's served him well in the past. Worley Alves, no gas tank. Sage Northcutt, a quitter. When he starts to fight the better guys, it becomes a problem because that mm-hmm. style don't work no more. Also... If for a guy that comes out of a wrestling heavy gym like the MMA lab, and for all the good qualities that Brian Barberina does have, he struggles in the wrestling department. He was taken down 12 times by Colby Covington, but hey, it's Colby Covington. He was also lost that fight against Leon Edwards based on him giving up the takedown. Jake Ellenberger could possibly get the takedown, but he doesn't shoot them. So if it's going to be a striking battle, Jake Ellenberger's best shot Brian Barberina can take. Brian Barberina's best shot Jake Ellenberger cannot take. They're going to go to, I'm not going to say war, because Jake Ellenberger knows better than to go to war. But look at when he's clinched up with Perry. That's when he's taking some damage. And Brian Barberino likes to clinch up and dish out those little shovel hooks from the clinch. Single collar tie, feed you the right hand. If it's at distance, what is Ellenberger? Ellenberger's not a combo puncher, and that's what you got to do against Barberino. you got to hit him with two or three and then get out. Even though this guy's faster and a better athlete, he's not going to do that. He's going to wind up on the one big punch, because that's generally what he does, and I just feel like volume's going to go towards Bar- Brian Barberina. This guy, at his best, can score 100 significant strikes. He landed 100 against Worley Alves, because once Worley started to get a little tired, he sensed that he put the foot on the, on, on the gas. If you're going to beat him, you got to take him down, and I don't think Ellenberg is going to do that. The line, you're right. Minus 500, I don't know. You know why you and I like Brian Barberina so much? Because you generally get some good value on yeah. the guy. I don't know that I and love now the him. books. The books in the, lo- the last little few Jake Ellen, the slide of the fall, I guess you would say, of Jake Ellenberger. We've seen some like relatively close to pick him, or like maybe he's a two to one, uh, yeah. two to one underdog, that type of thing. It's like the books have caught up now, and they're just like, this guy can't take a punch anymore. So it's like whoever you got to put anybody in this spot and Jake Ellenberger was going to be an underdog and maybe he should be because of his inability to take damage. But like, it's really crazy seeing such a wide number. Um, 
in a Brian Barberina fight because the guy fights close fights. Yeah, yeah. Here's one for you. It's the daily double of greasy theories. Wah, 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 wah. Uh -oh. Okay, here you go. Number one, Brian, uh, Brian Barberina made his UFC debut beating Joe Ellenberger by TKO. Either Jake Ellenberger is going to be fired up because he wants that revenge baby, or he's mentally defeated and is already in the fetal position waiting for Saturday night. <laughs> Which one are you going to go with? I'm saying fetal position. Give me Brian Barbrain. We got Davison Figueredo taking on John Moraga. Figueredo, 8,400 on DraftKings, minus 165 favorite. Moraga is 7,800 and plus 145. I like this Figueredo kid. Uh, he seems 30 years old, but I agree. He just kind of come <laughs> yeah. out of nowhere, and he, he looks good. He kind of came out of nowhere, yeah, I guess. He looks but good. 14 and 0. Yeah. Um, he's got the goods. He's got some power. Looks good coming off the bus. Game. He's got that. He's got that MMA look. You know, with the crazy, yeah, the yeah, crazy yeah. dyed hair. He looks like a. And I think I believe this is like his first like. You know, first fight stateside. So it's like, could affect right, him. Which could affect him. This guy him. had, it, it could be bad for him. It could be good. But I think this is like the right type of fight for the UFC to set up for him against a, a perennial top 10 guy in this division. Probably a guy who's getting transitioned into being a gatekeeper of this division. We've seen. Ah, he looks good right now, actually. We've seen guys like uh, the Russian. Yeah, but Bulatov. God, Bulatov. that cost me money. Oh, oh, boy. oh. Um, You know, and Moraga, it's like, if you beat Moraga, you're legit. Yeah, you, you deserve. Enough. You deserve to be up here. So fair we'll enough. see what we can get from Figueredo. He's been a great, great DraftKings score uh, so far in his career. Um, it, it's, it's tough, though. How good is his takedown defense when he gets to the ground? We've seen him kind of ball out on people on the feet. And all of these fights have been in Brazil against lesser competition. If Moraga starts just going for for takedowns or or finds a guillotine at some point, how does Figueiredo react to that? I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, that's why it makes it tough to bet on Figueiredo in this spot. But uh, I think I, I do like him as a DraftKings play at 80 at 8400. Like when, when we were talking about uh, Angela Hill. It's just like, well, Figueredo, if he wins, if he beats Moraga, I think the, his pressure style, his aggressive style of fighting lends more to being a high-scoring play here. So it's a tough spot for the guy. I think he's a, a decent GPP, GPP play on DraftKings. Um, I'm interested to hear your take, though. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to think GPP play, big GPP play, uh, when you got flyweights. Because, again, John Moraga is a guy that has not been finished a whole lot. Uh, when he is getting finished, he's getting his nose literally put to the side of his face from John Dodson. But, again, these situations don't really occur all the time. He is a tough gatekeeper type fighter. His last three fights, I mean, he's won them all. The, the Babulatov fight, I mean, you could say lucky punch, but damn, what a hell of a lucky punch to land, man, because that's a big win for you. But Wilson Hayes following up on that. Wilson Hayes has got a lot of merit to him. This guy mm -hmm. is a strong BJJ stylist. Grappling game is phenomenal. We've seen him just chew up wrestlers before, you know, just based on the ground game. And... It just seems like Moraga had his number. Moraga goes out there, he does what he has to do, and it makes you realize with old Johnny is that, hey, he's a well-rounded guy, former Arizona State University wrestler. He's got the wrestling. He's got good power in his hands for 125 pounds, and he's a guy that takes the punches and, you know, rolls with it. He stays in your face. He can stay in your face anyway. He's not the most aggressive guy, but he's been f tying together good game plans, getting the victories. With Figueredo, I believe Figueredo gets the victory. I believe that the striking is better than John Moraga. He should be able to back up John Moraga. He should be able to land more telling shots. But it's going to come down to his takedown defense. And even more so than that, Paul, it's going to come down to who's actually physically sitting there watching this fight scoring it. I believe this fight to go to the decision, and it's going to matter to what style pleases you as a judge. Because Figueredo's fight with Jared Brooks, I mean, if you want to talk about a contentious fight, this is him getting taken down multiple times. This is... 85% of people scoring the fight for Jared Brooks based on the takedowns. And it's we happen in Brazil. to be in Brazil. It's in Brazil. But I saw some people validating the fact that when Brooks got the fight to the ground, he couldn't do nothing. Figueredo generally neutralized him. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he's the one that's kind of hitting you from the bottom. He's a little more active from the bottom. When the fight stays standing, he's a better striker than you. Then he gets dumped back down again. How do you score that? I don't know. In America, I think that the wrestling and the being on top yeah. is going to score more. So if that exact same fight with Jared Brooks happens in Lincoln, Nebraska, Jared Brooks is getting his hand raised. Probably. And if John Moraga goes out there and uses his wrestling the way that he actually could use his wrestling he's going to be on top of Figueroa. he's going to probably just use his counter grappling to not get submitted win a couple of the rounds and get a close decision 
that would lead me to believe to try to avoid this one. The one is 145 on Moraga. Tempting. Tempting considering I have a lot of favorites. I need some dogs. This is a dog that has some merit. Figueroa at 14-0, we haven't really seen the, the glaring issue in his game, but maybe it's wrestling. And if it is wrestling and Moraga has another good game plan, which he follows to a T, then wrestling could be the problem here. So I'm largely going to avoid this fight. But again, I'm getting Moraga, sucked into the fact another, that... another guy from the MMA lab. Yeah, and you talked about the fact that Gatekeeper, if you beat him, you're legit, right? And with Figueroa, we don't know if he's legit. If no. he wins this fight, we'll know. But we don't know yet. It's true. And so that makes it a big test. I don't want to say it's a coin flip because if I was setting the line, I would set Figueroa as a minus 145 favorite, minus 165, kind of close enough. Yeah. He's the better striker. Fight goes to decisions, minus 140. I'm in on that. It's actually not to, uh, if you like it to go to decision, that's a that's a decent price there. Do you remember Matus Nicolau versus John Moraga and Matus Nicolau actually? Actually pop steroids and it was a split decision this yep. fight in my mind plays yeah. out very similar Fair Nicolau enough. keeps the fight standing fends off the takedowns when he can keeps it striking and just does a little bit more but that fight was also in Brazil and one guy tested positive for steroids and it was John Moraga so uh, it's a nice fight to break down yep we got uh, Eric Anders taking on Tim Williams uh, Eric Anders most expensive guy on DraftKings He's ninety seven hundred dollars. Been a while since we've seen a price that high on DraftKings. He's a minus one thousand favorite. Tim Williams is sixty five hundred and plus six fifty. Fight goes to decision is plus two seventy five. Everyone's telling you that Anders absolutely steamrolls Tim Williams, and there's a big disparity in athleticism here. I'll tell you that much. We have one guy who's a national champion for University of Alabama as like an inside linebacker. His team caps. And the other guy is super slow. He's very strong, physically strong, but good he's jiu slow. Yeah. He's got good jujitsu. Chin's a little bit questionable. Chin is questionable. Uh, Oscar Pachota um, checked that chin in uh, his UFC debut. Uh, or Tim Williams' UFC debut. Yeah, and that chip didn't pass that test. It did not pass the test. He scored four points uh, on DraftKings in that fight. But we were talking about before we came on air, and Eric Anders against Leota Machida in Brazil. I thought he won that fight. I thought he kind of got robbed. But the fact of, that fight. the, fact of the fight matter sure. is, is that he didn't do very much. He didn't mm. look like he was... Uh, what was the word we were look, uh, that I'm looking for? He wasn't attacking. He wasn't... Uh, he had no luck. Uh, he had no desire to no go desire. out there and, and, and switch the fight into the second gear. I get it. Yeah, I, I actually agree with that assessment. So $9,700 paying up for a guy. Maybe maybe the bright lights got him. It was his first main event. He's taking on a, a former in champion, yeah. a legend in, uh, in, in Leota Machida. But, and obviously they have set this fight back up for Eric Anders to get back on track. No but $9,700, it makes it very hard for roster construction. Like when you're paying up for him... You're digging deep on some of these other guys in this uh, on this card. So, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be... I, I may just fade Anders and hope that he doesn't become the top scorer, which is kind of scary, but uh, I think that's my general play here just because the price is just too much. I know that I know that Jake Ellenberger's chin is really bad, and I know that Brian Barberina pushes a pace. So, Brian Barberina doesn't necessarily have to finish early to pay off his price tag. I think Anders, based on the type of volume that we typically see from him, he needs to finish in the first round to pay off 9700 Yeah, if you're going to pay the 9700 for this guy, you need the first round knockout. And boy, oh boy, wouldn't it be awesome if he could knock him down a couple times and Williams yeah. could get back up prior to then and that's going possible. down the five. Well, you would need that because, yeah, the takedowns are there for Anders too. He could take down Williams all day if he wants to take down Williams. Hey, old Timmy Williams, the Southside Strangler, is actually a BJJ black belt. So, would you want to do that for your Anders? I don't know. I agree with your assessment on the Machida fight 100%, outside of the fact that I have Machida winning, because Anders is tentative, man. He has no desire to go out there and pull the trigger. The first couple rounds are close. He's allowing Machida to just do a little bit more, and Machida's winning those rounds, doing a little bit more. When Anders explodes, he's got power for days, man. Not only does he hurt Machida a couple of times, bust him wide open, but remember this Rafael Natal fight? Nothing's happening until it's all happening, mm -hmm. and he hits you and he hurts you. But in between those two fights against Marcus Perez, who we're going to talk about in a little bit, is a durable guy who he falls into another rhythm against. Yep. And the Machida fight, he falls into a rhythm against. 
I want to give him the benefit of the doubt that that fight's five rounds. He does never been five rounds. He doesn't know if he can go five rounds. And because he's a fast twitch muscle athlete, he probably doesn't want to go out there and, you know, blow out his load early and then have the bright lights and then have the Juve Mejia's raining down and then sucking for air as Leona Machida's still in your face. That could be a problem. But there's no date the no doubt the power is there. It seems like that's what Tim Williams struggles with mightily, is that in four of his he's had four official career losses, been finished in three of them. Um when guys put the pressure on them that they're bigger, physical, more stronger guys, stronger and more stronger, I'm, that's good sentence structure. But all the same, this is where he's going to struggle with guys. And with Eric Anders, you've got something here. Yeah, he's 31 years old. Yeah, he's a little bit old for a prospect, truth be told. But he's got a bit of a name because of college sports in which he's a phenomenal athlete. He is one of those phenomenal athletes that you're taking, transitioning to MMA. A little bit green, but I mean, hey, look at his run in LFA. I mean, I think as I said, he hadn't gone five rounds. He has gone five rounds. He bought Brandon Allen in LFA, went five rounds. Uh, the guy's got a good gas tank. He's got good wrestling good counter wrestling anyways you know can keep the fight standing his offensive wrestling relies heavily on just the fact that he's muscling guys down but maybe this guy could be something maybe this guy could be something to the tune that you send him to brazil to fight leota machida leota machida's not even signed to the ufc anymore they wanted eric Anders to win that fight mm -hmm. and he almost did win that fight some people yourself included believe that he did win that fight but all the same now you bring him back home now you give him a winnable fight as the main card opener on a free card where you're going to get some eyeballs, people are going to tune in. Hopefully, he's going to showcase himself against Tim Williams. Ten to one, dude. I don't like that at all because I've seen, I've seen Michael Chandler roll his ankle against Brent Primus. You know, I've seen guys. If only money grew on trees. John Jones is literally about three seconds away from giving his UFC title to Chael Sonnen on a broken toe. I don't know. Anything can happen. And 10 to 1 does make you worry. This is a fist fight. Eric Anders, I'm not going to say is unproven, but. We don't know what the final version of Eric Anders looks like. I think he steamrolls a guy like Tim Williams. Tim Williams is not the worst fighter on the UFC roster, but he's a live body, and he's live body in a spot to do a job. Pachota hit him with the head kick, and it completely just... Or Pachota just hits him, and Pachota's a grappler, by the way. I mean, he's yeah. a jiu-jitsu guy. Eric Anders is a power puncher. He's athletic. He closes the distance well. He puts knuckles on chins. And generally, guys go down. Tim Williams just hasn't shown enough durability to make me believe that he's going to last a prolonged period of time. And uh, if Eric Anders has got a bit of a chip on his shoulder after losing a close decision, he wants to make a statement. And if he wants to make a statement and he doesn't come out there lackadaisical, he probably puts Williams away in the first round. If not the first round, second round, because this guy doesn't tend to gas out. So I'm going to have to say Anders is the obvious selection. The 9700, it's very, very expensive. It's not that we don't like yeah, for people like, oh, I can't believe it. It's just like, it's just having to having to add him to your roster it just changes it changes the whole dynamic of the team that you're able to construct sure, right sure. there's other guys that may that we'll talk about a little bit later on that i think you can probably slide down to and maybe you have the same upside in terms of their overall score i got a i got a play for later that we're going to get to it's risky it would allow you to afford a guy like anders and the one saving grace for anders is that i think he's got a higher ceiling or at least i think he's could should score more than Brian Barberena, but everybody's on Brian Barberena. Yeah. Everybody likes him, and they all like him inside the distance, which is actually nice odds. If you like Brian Barberena by TKO, I think it was still in the plus money last time I checked. Now it's, it's probably getting minus, to minus 137 now. So it is getting starting to get steamed. Yeah, and, but that just goes to prove the point that everyone, everybody everyone likes Brian Barberena like, to finish. Everyone's just like Jake's chin is gone. Doesn't matter who he's fighting. So if you've got an extra two hundred bucks and you can pay up to Eric Anders, which an extra two hundred bucks on a card like this is a lot, mm -hmm. and if you can pay up to Eric Anders, he's going to be less owned and he yeah, can score enough. just as many, if not more. All right, let's move on. We got uh, Warley Alves taking on James Krause. Warley Alves is 9,300 and a minus 390 favorite. James Krause is 6,900 and plus 320. Fight goes to decision, minus 110. It's a pick em for the fight yeah, to go to no, decision. I, I Warley Alves, in, in my opinion, from what we have seen in the past, this guy's a pure fade. Because uh, I'm not saying that I want James Krause. I'm saying I want no, I, I will not have any exposure to uh, to to Worley Alves on DraftKings. This fight is a pick -em to go to decision. Worley Alves doesn't have the most high-volume attack. He gasses usually when we get through two rounds. Oh, yeah. It's an easy non-play. If he ends up being the guy who scores the most, then so be it. But I think this is an easy, easy fight to stay away from. Um, I would be, I would prefer James Krause, maybe. Maybe James Krause able to pull something off in round three when Worley Alves is tired. 
I know that I think in uh, Alvarez's last fight, he did look like he had a little bit of an improved gas tank, but like it's still there. I'm not convinced that he has fixed all of that. If James Krause is able to keep a high pace against this guy, not get caught in a guillotine. Mm, that's a risk. It's a risk. Of course, but I don't think James Krause is going to be going for too many takedowns here. Jesse I think Taylor he stays at distance and he tries to... He tries to uh, he tries to strike with him. Yeah. And uh, I think, yeah, James Krause would be my preferred play here. By no means do I like him. I, I think my straight-up pick would, would be Worley Alves to win. But he is. it's easy to stay away from Worley Alves at 9,300 here. At 9,300? I don't want Worley Alves. At minus 390? I don't really want yeah. Worley Alves. But do I think Worley Alves wins the fight? Yeah. This is the kind of fight that James Krause struggles with. James Krause has got some size at 155. 170? Not physical enough. Yeah, he's on a two-fight winning streak, but I don't think he's looked particularly all that good. And I feel like Worley Alves can take his best shots, and he'll move forward. He's a power guy. That's all he does. You're right. He's not a combo hitter, but he goes out there, and he throws some serious power into his shots. His, his wrestling game, again, not particularly the cleanest, not the most efficient, but it's all power. It's based mm -hmm. on power. And that's how James Christ eventually gets taken down. And yeah, Worley Alves has got a snappy little guillotine choke on him. Yeah, notably, the only man to beat Colby Covington with said guillotine. Also beat Nordin Taleb with the guillotine. Almost had Brian Barber. I don't think he almost had him. Brian Barber in his big old beard at him protected. I had Barber in that spot. But again, he threatens hard with that guillotine and actually gasses out his arm trying to finish that guillotine on Barbara, Brian Barberina. One of the reasons why he gassed. Uh, his fight with Salim Tuari, he looked fucking awful, man. Bad. Gassed after two rounds, didn't look good. And then as you're saying, he looked a little bit better in terms of conditioning for his last fight when he took on Sultan Aliyev. But that fight didn't go to third round. Sultan Aliyev's eye was completely mangled True. and closed after the second. So we don't know if he would have had a classic Worley Alves gas out in that third round. True. But no, Styles make fights, I always say. And I honestly feel like he's just too strong for James Krause. If he wants to close the pocket, he will. If he wants to pin James Krause against the cage, he will. If he wants to fight standing or on the ground, it's him to dictate that. And even though James Krause is a good striker, he lacks the pop to get Worley Alves' attention. Worley Alves has got the kind of body kick, he's got the kind of right hand that he's going to be able to score. He's going to be able to just you know, pile it up for the judges. The other thing with James Krause is as good as we remember him being as a stand-up fighter, he's usually trying to get the fight to the ground now. He doesn't really yeah. want to stand for a prolonged period of time. And I don't know that he's got the strength or the wrestling to take down Worley Alves. Yeah, so enough. worst case scenario, Worley Alves does gas out. It'll be up two rounds by the time he gasses yeah, out. Right. I don't know that Krause is going to finish him in that point. So... Yeah, I don't want him in DraftKings. I don't really love that straight money line, but that is my pick. I am taking Worley Alves. The fight, the fight is just a victory. pure fade all around. Just go back, alive. yeah, and this is going back a while, but go back and watch James Krause versus Shane Campbell from BC. Actually, he's from Ontario. He lives in BC now, but you go back and watch that fight, and Shane Campbell actually outstrikes him. It's the takedowns for James Krause allows him to ultimately defeat uh, uh, my guy, Shane Campbell. But late in that third round, Shane Campbell gets the takedown. Shane Campbell mounts him. Shane Campbell beats the piss out of him. And if this is five seconds more in that third round, this fight's over for Shane Campbell. That's Shane Campbell outstriking you standing and having some flashes of brilliance on the ground against you. Those are your two domains. You're supposed to be a lengthy striker who is ultimately going to get guys to the ground. I feel like Krause has spent so much time at Glory Fitness and MMA in Kansas being the head coach, mm -hmm. getting guys guys ready that he himself hasn't really evolved yeah. and now that he's not going down to 155 pounds he's gonna beat tom galicchio he's gonna beat guys that you know he's gonna he's a little bit bigger than anyways but he's gonna hit a wall against these big 170s warley alves big 170 big and that's gonna screw him and again if you're alves and you know the only thing wrong with your game is your lack of conditioning then please god just work on that everything else seems to check out for him as long as he doesn't gas so give me Worley Alves, but I don't really like the pricing on it. We have Corey Sanhagen taking on Yuri Alcantara. Corey Sanhagen, 9,000 on DraftKings, minus 240 favorite. Yuri Alcantara is 7,200 and plus 200. Fight goes to decision, minus 105, so pretty much a straight pick him. Sanhagen, when we saw him take on Austin Arnett in his first fight, really, really high volume, ended up getting the finish too. Scored 133 points. Alcantara, we were talking about it actually off air before we came on here. The, the problem with these guys... Is that uh, is that he's 38 years old and he's yeah. in the bantamweight division? It's just like your shelf life; it just kind of runs to a to a close at some point. It's just not you're not able to keep up with the young, hungry kids that are just so much faster. Heavyweight, you can kind of rely on your power. Power, they always say, is the last thing to leave. That yeah, type of fair thing, enough. Right. And when we look at look, how how many old guys at the lower weight classes, you go under under 155. How many old guys, guys over 35 years old, really 
It, it, it's just a downturn. No, I hear From you. the time that you turned to 35. I know you're usually the resident ageist on this podcast because I'm a little bit older than you, so I try to defend the old guys. <laughs> the Russian but guys are always lying about their age. Fair, yeah, well, yeah, you always point out that as well. Uh, Uri Alcantara could be 45 for all we know. That's like that he claims that he's 38, but... Uh, uh, I like Sandhagen here. He's when I was referring to earlier about guys that I would just pay down. He has, I think, as as high of an upside as anybody here. Just the type of pressure and the type of pace that this guy sets in his fights. I think he has a, a, about as high of an upside. He doesn't even necessarily need to get the finish in the first round based on the pressure that he that he gives uh, to his opponents. I think at nine thousand, he's an easy guy to to th- slot into your roster. He could even be the top guy on your roster could and be, then you can go be. a little bit more of a balanced approach right. rather when you pay up for for Barbarino yeah, or, or anders, you pay up for right. anders you got to find the underdogs and you got to find the underdogs that hit big mm-hmm. to really cash whereas sandhagen i think is four is uh is probably a little bit lower because he could get caught in a submission yuri is pretty crafty and that's usually crafty how he bitch. that's how he catches people and that's how he that's how he wins in his old age now but uh, I think, you know, his ceiling is about as high as those other two guys. Yeah, I mean, we talk about this often that Yuri Alcantara is actually just super untrustworthy because he has flashes of brilliance and he can make it happen. You know, that Brad Pickett fight, bam, out of nowhere, and he gets the finish with the triangle choke. Looks real nice. That Luke Sanders fight, oh, he's taking a life change and beaten. And he pulls out the knee bar. It's like, damn, you know what? Yuri Alcantara, he's a dynamic guy. He's an athletic guy. But you're right. At 38 years old, once your athleticism starts to kind of slow down, once you're all of a sudden the old guy in the division, the end creeps very, very quick, quickly. And you're looking at a 38-year-old Yuri Alcantara here against a 26-year-old Corey Sanhagen. That's just a passing of the torch kind of fight. It's the old dog against that new kid on the block. The 9,000, I don't love it because you'd have to go out there and knock out Yuri Alcantara. And I just don't know that he's going to finish him because Alcantara, yeah, he's the savvy veteran. He's fought the division's absolute best fighters. He's literally fought the best Does guys. Does he need to get the knockout, though? He can score 100 points in a decision. If he goes out there and scores 100 significant strikes, with, yeah, sure. is he going to take him down? No, take down. No, probably no. not take down. No, so he's going to have to get a lot of significant strikes on Alcantara. And Alcantara's been bombed on before, but a lot of the time he's kind of on his back getting bombed on. The thing that really sets to me that Corey Sanhagen will win this fight is when you look at Alcantara against Alejandro Perez, writing's on the wall, buddy. If you can't outpoint... And you, we always talk about Perez. Just yeah, does he's a, the weasel. He's a weasel. He just he just does a shout out Finds to Daniel a, Levy. Yeah, yeah he, he just does a shack. Great listen, by the way. Yeah. If anybody uh, enjoys MMA podcast, I'm sure you're listening to this. You're Half enjoying, the battle. Yeah, absolute must watch. Sure, but, there's a big crossover. But they're so right, dude. The fucking guy's a weasel. He yeah. just doesn't have to weasel, hustle up these decisions. But when you're losing to him, red flag that you're allowing someone who's moderately talented to hustle you up. And when he fought Perez, I had him bet. I didn't have a whole lot on him, but how is this guy who used to be a top 10 abandoned way, how does he fall in that much down? And you get an idea of, yeah, fallen way down because he's getting outpointed by Alejandro Perez. And when I look at this fight, Sanhagen, if it was Sanhagen versus Perez, I would have Sanhagen. I think he's a better volume puncher. He works the body. Nasty body punches, buddy. You look at him in the LFA run and then as well as coming to the UFC against Austin Arnett. Austin Arnett's shown that he's somewhat durable. Like, he can take a punch. He just gets completely belted out by Sanhagen. Sanhagen is a good striker. I think he's just going to go out there and outpoint Yuri Alcantara. But if he gets into a rhythm where he knows I'm beating Alcantara and I know this guy's dangerous and I know he's a savvy veteran and I don't want to take the chance of trying to finish him if he's not all the way out and he's going to try to grapple with me, if he just plays it a little bit tentative, I don't think he's going to get his 100 points. And if he's not going to get his 100 points, maybe the $9,000 is a steep price on him. I don't mind the minus 240. I know that could be viewed as steep as well, but I do feel like he's on the safer side of picks. If I'm playing a cash game team, maybe I go with Sanhagen. But if I'm going for that big GPP, I'm not fully sold that he goes out there and just dices out a savvy veteran like Alcantara and really pays up for this value. I think I'd be more willing to just take a big dog that I think has some upside and then take one of my quote-unquote locks, a guy like Anders or a guy like Barbarina, who should be you know, the big scorers of the week. But again, Sanhagen will be less owned, and guys like you that could play him, if he is the top scorer, that's going to bode very well for your lineup. So I do see the merit. I'm just personally a little bit off the 9,000 on DK. Outside of that, Sanhagen should get the victory. I'll be playing. Interestingly. Well, I'm, now I'm starting to look at this card and go, where is the underdog that Cody's talking about? Don't, don't spill the beans right now. We'll get there. 
eventually. Moving on down the card, we have Marcus Perez taking on Andrew Sanchez. We got uh, Perez is uh, 8,200 on DraftKings and plus 100 underdog taking on Sanchez, who's 8,000 and minus 120. Obviously, based on how the pricing versus this is, is that Perez probably opened up as a slight favorite and... It was always basically a pick on, but yeah. now there's been some money in coming in on Sanchez. Sanchez is an interesting case because we were talking about guys gassing and a little fight. We're two fights off. We're talking about Warley Alves. Obviously, their styles are different, but yeah. Sanchez has some good wrestling and he usually takes guys down early on, but he gasses in round three. Ask a, a Ryan James, who was like a five to one underdog, getting getting his ass beat. Well, he was able to turn it up. Ass beat, dog. It was a 10 8 first round. Yeah. So like, what? He, he was, How did he turn this around? Yeah, like, I, people thought he was next. Like, certain refs would have stopped that fight in yeah, round one, yeah, in fair. fairness. But, fair. uh, but yeah, Sanchez runs out of gas in round three, it, especially if you're grinding and trying to get back up and making it a dirty fight. Um, the one problem that Marcus Perez has is that's you can really take him down, you can control him. Like, that is. Uh, uh, the major path to victory against him. So this is a very interesting. Sanchez's chin is a little bit questionable as well. His last two knockouts were nasty. Exactly. Nasty. So this is a real dicey one. Yeah. Um, it's either Sanchez gets those takedowns and squeaks one out, and if things get dirty in in round three, he's able to just hold on, and uh, or 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 uh, Perez finds that chin and knocks him out. I don't really. I don't really have a real pick on this one either way, to be perfectly honest. In our tout master, which I'm doing terrible in, um, I'm going to be picking the underdog, whoever the underdog is, by the time that sure. uh, by the little the form goes up. Yeah. Um. I, I, maybe you have a hot take on this one. I really don't. Yeah, this could be a saftic moment, but I like Andrew Sanchez. I like Andrew Sanchez quite a bit here. Okay. Um. He's got all the parts, dude. He could be a top 15 guy. Not a world beater. He's not a top 10 guy. But he's got all the parts, man. I think he's a three-time national champion, NIAI, uh, you know, wrestler. Junior so college, he's yeah. a junior college guy, but still, he's winning sure. national titles. He's a former All-American. The wrestling's there. He's a BJJ black belt. He's won world titles in the sport of BJJ, both gi and no gi. His stand-up, pretty serviceable, dude. Actually, really not all that bad. You see him go out there. Boxing, really not all that bad. Low leg kick game, you know, checks out. He seems to have all the parts. It's just, yeah, it has to be gas tank. If you watch him against Ryan James, he doesn't appear to be gassing out in the slightest bit. After two rounds, it looks like, damn, this guy can go all day. Someone go back and watch it from, I'll just watch it myself. But I think after the second round, they compliment how unbelievable this guy's cardio looks. And then the third round starts, he's and got he's got fucking left. gas, man. I don't know what it is. It's probably an adrenaline dump. It's probably the fact that he's like, that I'm up two up. rounds, really excited, and then he's just like, oh god. Yeah, but he also burnt himself trying to finish James because he sees the finish there, and yeah. he goes after it, and True. he bombs on him, and that takes a lot out of you. So you give him a pass. The Anthony Smith fight, first of all, Anthony Smith is kicking some fucking serious ass right now at 205 pounds. Andrew Sanchez gives him everything that he can handle, but he just gasses out again. And then when you're fighting a dangerous guy and you're tired, bad recipe. James is not even considered really that dangerous but you're a punching bag when you're tired and mm -hmm. this is an mma fight against a professional who's been training for eight to 12 weeks to take your head off they're ready to go if you gas out it's a big problem and that's what's kind of happened to him in his last two fights outside of that it's all there when i look at this marcus perez fight he's going to take marcus perez down i'm fairly certain of that when he's on the ground he's better on the ground even though perez is you know a decent grappler himself and has some nice nice little submissions uh, got a big win over Ian Hessinch back in his LFA days with the submission. So that's a big victory. I don't see him materializing in Sanchez. He's a better grappler. He's a better wrestler. He gets this fight to the ground. The one issue is that, well, gotcha. Marcus Perez actually showed some durability against Anders, right? He's flopping around a little bit, but Anders is hitting him. Anders is grounding him. Anders is pounding on him, and he takes it. And after two rounds, he's still there. So I think Sanchez does get the takedowns. I think Sanchez does pound on him. But after two rounds, I, I think this fight's going the distance, personally. I think Perez is going to be able to last. I think Sanchez is going to dictate the action he's going to win. But it's going to go three. And if it goes three, the third round is usually where he blows it. So I'm willingly saying I think this fight goes into deep waters. And deep waters is where Andrew Sanchez has typically... But you're hoping to, that maybe he's fix that part of his game a little yes and also when you look at him when he's at his best when he's taking on khalil roundtree in the uh, finale of the ultimate fighter he doesn't gas it's all day all yeah. day he just takes this guy down to the point that remember uh khalil has to tell his mama like mom shut up <laughs> because she's like get up khalil 
He's getting ridden like a small pony. His nickname is the War Horse, so I guess there's a joke that could be tied in there. But Sanchez is all over him. The problem is, is that when you gas out and you got a good finisher in front of you, like, by the way, Ryan Jane's black belt, sure, but Ryan Jane's got a great chin, and he's aggressive. He comes at you. Mm -hmm. That didn't bode well for him. Anthony Smith, we know you give this guy one opportunity. Hector Lombard was kicking his ass for two rounds too. But you give him that one opportunity, he can make something happen out of it. Prez isn't that guy. Doesn't have that one-shot power. The submission game, which could be something, I don't think it works against Sanchez. And the takedown defense is just not good enough. So I think Sanchez wins this fight. Hopefully he's attempted to correct the cardio issues. But if he hasn't, 29-28, win the first two. Don't get finished in the just third survive. round for a change. And he should be able to get it. The 8,000, because I think he's going to get takedowns, I like it. The minus 120, yeah, again, I like it. Near even fight, fight. I think the merits on Andrew Sanchez. Again, it shame on me for going for losing his last two fights. Truly, I have bet Andrew Sanchez's last two, and I have come out on the on the losing side of it. I don't You're think due. it's going to. Yeah, You're due. I'm, I'm due. I don't think it's going to be three in a row. And if it is, I've obviously overestimated Andrew Sanchez. But former tough champion, please God, don't end up being <laughs> the worst tough champion of all times. You know, at least let's let James Wilkes keep that honor. Get a fucking win here. Move your career forward, please. We got Mickey Gall taking on George Sullivan. Mickey Gall, 9,200 on DraftKings, minus 330. Favorite, George Sullivan, the silencer. Coming back, feels like he's fought years ago. I can't remember the last time. I thought he was off the roster. I I forgot that this guy was even around. Uh, he's 7,000 and plus 270. Fight goes to decision, plus 185. They're saying, hey, we don't think this goes to decision. Uh, Mickey Gall, 4-1, and one, though, uh, hasn't. Obviously, he's always going to give up uh, experience to everybody not named CM Punk now, yeah, in the yeah. UFC. But um, I think we see a guy who is de definitely dedicated to the craft. Sullivan is borderline fringeworthy on uh, on in my in my books. <sighs> don't go there. I'm not going to go there. Don't yet. go there. I'm not. Gonna, he hasn't been mm. around for a long time, so I don't feel as confident saying there. But everyone, anyone who's a hardcore fan knows where I'm thinking of going with that. I think Gall wins. I don't mind paying up for Gall on DraftKings. Minus 330. Sure. I, I don't think I'm going to be parlaying it, but uh, I, I can see the merit. He's just not experienced enough for me to trust that uh, Sullivan, who has, what, four or five times the amount of fights, won't be able to know every trick that's in the bag for Mickey Gall, but uh, I think Gall wins pretty clearly. Yeah, I'm actually, this is where I'm going to save this my is money. your underdog? Yeah, I'm going to go with George Sullivan wow. here. I know, I know that's obviously not the popular opinion considering he's a 3-1 to one underdog no. here. But yeah, man, I think a lot of people are overvaluing Mickey Gall. Mickey Gall's got a little name cachet because he beat Sage Northcutt and CM Punk, but really, what has he shown us to make us believe that this is a credible fighter? He's a work in progress. He's a guy that right now, 4-1 and one is his MMA record. Um, he could have fought a guy like Sage Northcutt, a guy like CM Punk, and a guy like Mike Jackson on the regional scene. He could be fighting for LFA right now and be four and one. And you know what they would tell him? You know what, kid? Win three more and win three more good fights, and we'll bring you to the UFC. Yeah. I don't think he's UFC ready. I think he's a guy that got that fight with CM Punk. Now he's got a contract. Now we got to build him along. So we're trying to give him, you know, winnable fights. But at some point, he's got to take that next step up, and he has very you know, hasn't looked particularly good. Let's go back to the Sage Northcutt fight, right? So he's 2-0 in the UFC. The Mike Jackson fight, anybody could have won that. So I, I give it no merit. Yeah. The CM Punk fight, anybody could have won that. So I don't give it any merit. The Sage Northcutt fight. Sage is looking good right now. Let's talk about that fight. But Sage, Sage is young Sage's at the time. improved a lot since that fight. Too. Yeah, yeah. He, Sage's Northcutt has improved leaps and bounds. And to me, Mickey Gall really hasn't made the same. If you put them back in the ring together, I'm on Sage all day long because mm -hmm. I think he stuffs the takedowns and I think he's a much dynamic, better striker. He's faster. He he packs more power. Cardio doesn't seem to be an issue and he's becoming a man now. He's not a quitter like he used to be. He's developing. So Gall in that fight. Brown. Yeah, but Gall in that fight against Sage Northcutt doesn't look fantastic. First round he gets the takedown. Yeah, he's winning this fight. The second round he starts to look bewildered. He starts to look a little bit tired. Sage Northcutt starts to hit this guy. Sage Northcutt is starting to find a bit of a rhythm, dare I say. And then Gall just gets him down again, and then Gall gets the submission. So we don't know how that fight would have progressed, but it certainly seemed like momentum was starting to swing towards Northcutt before the takedown ultimately saved him and helped him out. Then we go to the Randy Brown fight. I myself am now thinking, okay, you know what? Maybe there's something to make you go. Everyone talks about his grappling. Uh, he's got a couple cool little judo throws. I haven't seen much of his wrestling. And his striking, outside of him dropping Mike Jackson as Mike Jackson was trying to reel away, I haven't really seen much of his striking. So I don't know that all the parts are there, 
But hey, you know, Randy Brown kind of struggles again on the ground. So, you know, the guy actually struggled mightily against Eric Montano on the ground. Maybe Mickey Gall is able to beat him. He's not in that fight at any point. He scores no takedowns in that fight. The only moment he has is in the second round. Randy Brown's on top of him. He's able to hit a sweep, get on top of Randy Brown for a little bit, but does nothing for it. He scored seven significant strikes in 15 minutes against Randy Brown. Mm -hmm. He had nothing standing. He had nothing on the ground. He scored no takedowns against Randy Brown. So I don't know that his wrestling is really all that good. And there's a point in the fight where it's like, okay, Gall, even when he gets top position, okay, Gall, you're the grappler. This is what you do. You're supposed to be really good. Everyone's talking about how, you know, he's got excellent coaching and that he's making a lot of improvements. Show me something. But there's nothing to be shown. And then that third round, I actually got it 1-1 because he spent a good majority of the second round on top. Got nothing. There's nothing in the tank. I'm not going to say he has no heart because he didn't fold up camp and quit on himself and get finished, but it's not there. It's a learning experience. It's what a young fighter needs to experience on a regional scene before coming to the UFC. Okay, had to experience it. This is going to be good for him. Maybe he's made the improvements he's, that are necessary. Maybe he's developed. Who knows? Maybe he's he can now beat George Sullivan. But George Sullivan, A, has five times the amount of fights that he has, just like you said. George Sullivan, B, not doesn't come from a wrestling background, but being from New Jersey, he fought a lot of D1 All-Americans on his way to the UFC. And I've seen him out wrestle some tough cats. I've seen him get taken down five times by Dominic Waters, but his wrestling's not that bad. He's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, under Kurt Pellegrino. Mm -hmm. So if Gall gets the fight to the ground, they're both brown belts. And you know what? George Sullivan did get finished his last time by Nico Price. That doesn't give me a whole lot of boost. But like you're saying, we hadn't seen Sullivan in a while. Two-year USADA ban. Then he came back. He got choked out by Price. Obviously not a very memorable fight. You don't really recall it. But, dude, that's a lot of ring rust. You had two years on the sideline. You come back as a 36-year-old man, and your first fight against Nico Price he makes it to the second round. We all know what happens. The longer you go and fights with Nico Price, the guy's the magic man. He finds a way to beat you. I think Sullivan will be a little bit better version of himself here. I think that he's good enough to largely avoid the takedowns with Mickey Gall, which would allow it to be a stand-up fight. And if it is a stand-up fight, he's a better striker than Gall. Gall also doesn't seem to have that three-round cardio, whereas Sullivan, typically when he loses, is getting fished before, finished before that. But, you know, he's been in there with Tim Means. He's been in there with Alexander Yakovlev. He's been in there with Nico Price. He's fought in the much better guys, and he's at least shown some glimpses. And his two victories in the UFC, Igor Arroyo and Dominic Waters, didn't look all that bad. So I think he keeps the fight standing. I think he's a better striker than Gall. I think he gets the victory. The minus 7,000, yeah, as far as DraftKings goes, even if he minus only gets 7, me. Minus 7,000. Sorry. Free. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Free. The $7,000 they're going to pay on DraftKings. He's one of the cheaper plays. I think he's going to be able to get the victory. As far as the plus 270 go, yeah, I mean, that's value if you've ever seen value. This is a card that is largely, largely built on favorites for me anyway. So I need a dog. I need a credible dog. I feel like Sullivan could get it. And even if he loses, you know, he's worth the risk because of the price tag. If he's a plus 150, nah. If he's a plus 190, nah. If you're going to give me this guy for plus 270, all right. I, I'm willing to take a shot on it. So you sold I, me. I'm going to say George Sullivan You're, hopefully hopefully goes me. out there and gets the job done. And Hopefully we don't get saftic. Because you've sold me now, so I'm going to blame you. When I lose my DraftKings lineups, I'm going to be real triggered. Let me ask you this, because this is what I'm also convincing myself in my mind. If CM Punk didn't have the name, if he was just skill set CM Punk, and Sage Northcutt didn't have that name. And that was Sage Northcutt yeah. before we've seen what he's become. George Sullivan would have beaten both of those guys probably as well. Yeah, George Sullivan beats these guys. But beyond that is that Mickey Gall wouldn't be that big of a favorite because we would only look at him as a 4 and one pro who hasn't looked particularly good yeah. and he fights low-level competition. It's that he's beat two guys with big names. So MMA fans, even the hardcores, a lot of guys don't know who George Sullivan is, right? So when they look at this, they see Mickey Gall, who I know, versus George Sullivan, whom I'm very unfamiliar with. Well, everyone's saying Gall's going to beat him. Yeah, Gall's going to beat him. Okay, Gall's going to beat him. Money's coming in on Gall because of the name. If we're just looking at pure skill set, not there. And my last point on it, I know it sounds like I'm on his balls now. It's two shout-outs, one show. But yeah, Daniel Levy called this in the Randy Brown fight. He, he called this to a T. I didn't quite believe it because I thought this guy's a little bit better than I thought. 
but I bought into the hype too. And now when I see that he's still a 3-1 to one favorite, I'm thinking, the hype's still there. So maybe there's a good chance to fade the guy one more time and get some value out of it. So uh, George Sullivan, a little bit of a play. Joanne Calderwood, 8,800 on DraftKings. Kalindra Faria is 7,400, minus 170. JoJo, plus 150. Faria, fight goes to decision, minus 400. They're saying, let's go. This fight is going three rounds. Do these people score either way? I think it's hard not to like the minus 170 on JoJo. I think she is the better all-around striker. I think... Her time at TriStar has kind of helped to round out her game as well. I like JoJo, but I do see some people out there on Far- Faria, which, which scares me a little bit. Um, I, I, I think JoJo, it almost seems too good. It seems too good to be true. I don't think very highly of Faria whatsoever. Um, JoJo is the much more dynamic striker. I think she has a higher uh, likelihood of getting a finish in this fight. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to find ways to not like JoJo. I don't like 8800 on DraftKings. I, I'm I don't th- especially when we think the fight's going the distance. Exactly. Most people believe this fight to go three rounds. And uh, JoJo doesn't throw nearly enough uh, volume to really pay off that price tag. But uh, minus 170, I do like Calderwood to get the job done here. Uh, maybe you're maybe you're thinking differently. Maybe you can talk me off the ledge on this one. Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's compare this one a little bit to the Corey Sanhagen fight in that. I think that the Corey Sanhagen fights go in the distance. And for the 9,000, you're talking about the fact that you think it still, could still be worth it because of the volume striking, right? Joanne Calderwood, you're saving $200. And you know what? The same concept largely applies here is that she probably doesn't get the finish, but the volume striking's there. You look at her last three fights. This is what's, what's notable about it. The last three fights, right? Her last fight, she loses to Cynthia Calvillo because of the wrestling. You know, she's getting taken out. She's getting controlled. Fight before that, Jessica Andrade. She gets submitted in the first round, well, because of the ground game. The fight before that, Valerie Letourneau, that is a stand-up battle. That is a fight where Joanne Calderwood goes and scores above 100 significant strikes. This is a strike of delight. She's a three-time European Muay Thai champion. She wants to keep the fight standing. Generally, opponents want to take her down. Back in the day in Victor, when they couldn't take her down, she butchered them. Dr. Neville, that's what they call her. Jojo Bad Mofo, that's what they used to call her in her Cage Warriors days. She's a good striker, but as she's progressed through the ranks, even in the Ultimate Fighter House, she's favored to do very good, and she loses to Rose Namajunas based on the ground game. The ground game has largely eluded her. I think going to TriStar is going to help her with that, but still, we haven't seen the immediate results because she's still losing to relatively gl- green, one-dimensional wrestler grapplers like Cynthia Calvillo. But you're going to give her a girl here in Kalindra Feria who is not looking to go to the ground. In yeah. fact, the last time we seen her on the ground, it was a pitiful effort against Patello. So, yeah, her last outing, she gets the victory. But, you know, it's going to be a stand-up battle. She wants to keep the fight standing. She's a strong, powerful girl. And Joanne Calderwood, quite honestly, that's where she makes her money, in the stand-up department. The other thing with Calderwood... And, this is like a behind the curtains thing that you know about it, I know about it, but like she balloons up massively in between fights and then has to cut down to 115 pounds, generally drains herself out, shows up to the fight, doesn't really have that energy, and you don't know what you're getting out of her. She's a 50-50 fighter. When she's on, dude, she's on. When she's off, boy, oh boy, is she off. She has confidence issues, but beyond that, I think the weight cut's a large, large hindrance for her. 125, which is where this fight's going to take place, is the weight class for Joanne Calderwood. That weight cut will keep her happy in camp. Hopefully, she's staying positive. Hopefully, she's staying confident. And if you're going to give me a confident Joanne Calderwood in a striker versus striker battle, yeah, minus 170, sign me up. The 8800, I don't love it. But again, she's going to be not very owned because she's got a relatively high price tag. And people are looking at the fact that her last two performances, she hasn't scored very high. But you look at the last time she got a straight 15 minutes of striking, she pieced up. Valerie Letourneau. And for anybody saying Letourneau shot, well, she's 2-0 in Bellator right now and hasn't really looked all that bad, so she's mm-hmm. not all the way shot. It's just when Calderwood's on, she makes you look shot because she keeps you in the body. She keeps you at range. She elbows you. She knees you. She's so dirty in that, cl- in that clinch with just, you know, dirty boxing. And again, the elbows. She's got nasty Muay Thai game. And I think she's just going to do enough to beat Ferry. Ferry is not a, a very impressive fighter. She has big lulls of inactivity. And when she does fight, she's your typical heavy, strong Brazilian fighter. Stands in the pocket. And just try to be more powerful than you, but... Technique should win outright, and Calderwood's got the technique advantage. So maybe I'm falling myself into a trap here, but but I like Calderwood. Yep. All right, we got uh, Drew Dober taking on John Tuck. Drew Dober, 8,900 on DraftKings, minus 210 favorite. 
John Tuck is 7300 and plus 175. Who you got? You know what? The price is not the most appealing thing in the world. $8,900 on Drew Dober. Like, John Tuck's actually talented. He just, again, has very, very little ring IQ. He has poor decision-making skills in the ring. But if you look at the fact that he's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, he's got nasty power, dude. But he really only throws one or two punches at a time. He lets fights slip away from him. The Josh Emmett fight. Emmett has a dislocated finger and is running away. And still, Tuck's just not really going after it. He's a very frustrating fighter. Going back to when he was on The Ultimate Fighter Season 15, bounced from the show because of an injury. But he looked like he had the goods. He's a Super Saiyan John Tuck. Looks like, hey, this is a good grappler who's an athletic, quick guy. But... We talk a card with guys like Worley Alves on it. We talk a, a card with guys like uh, Andrew Sanchez on it. The worst gas tank on the card is John Tuck. This guy gasses out almost guaranteed every single time. Very frustrating. And that's going to be a big problem here. Because he's going out there and trying to average 40 significant strikes, 50 significant strikes maybe. Drew Dober can, has the ability to go out and score 100 significant strikes. We've seen him do it before, namely in his last fight. Uh, he goes out there and he more or less puts on a clinic. He's getting better. He's still only 29 years old. I think that sky is definitely not the limit for Drew Dober. We know what Drew Dober is, but what Drew Dober is beats this level of opposition. I don't want to say he's basically already fought John Tuck, but his last fight against Frank Camacho, let's look at the similarities here, okay? Frank Camacho and John Tuck. They're both pretty much from the island of Guam. John Tuck's like one island over, but it's basically Guam. Okay, they're both from there. Whatever, easy similarity. They're both apparently high-end BJJ black belts from the, you know, like the Asian Pacific. Okay, they're both from Guam. They're both black belts. They both got hellacious one-punch power for the first five minutes, and then they gas. And that's what happens with Drew Dober. Drew Dober had a fight of the night against Frank Camacho, but he took Camacho's best punches and he kept coming mm -hmm. and he leveled them up. He doubled them up on the significant strikes. He pushed the action. He got the victory. Even when he got hit and he got hurt, he recovered. So Tuck's best option here is catching Drew Dober, but eh, you're going to knock out Dober? You seen the shape of Dober's head? Bring up the board for Drew Dober. Look at that thing, man. Obviously, it was built and bred into him for combat. And you know what? With the all jokes aside, look at his chin. He's been knocked out one time in nine years as a pro fighter, and it happened seven years ago. So you're saying that it's a good thing, but that actually just looks like a big target. You know what? You There's could... no shortage of chin. We always talk about John Lineker as having like the small little scrunched in face. This is the exact opposite. John John Lineker, you can't hit his chin because it doesn't really exist. This guy's got, he's all chin. You know what? But look at Bigfoot Silva. Obviously, before his gigantism completely wrecked havoc on his body, causing him to need TRT, then he wasn't given said TRT, and then he could not take a punch. Yeah. But prior to that, it's like, it don't matter how big his chin is, he could take a punch. You know, what Eric Pele knocked about back in the Bodog days. But this guy could take a punch. And yeah, I agree with myself on the statement that Drew Dober can take a punch. The one issue with Dober in this spot is that his last three losses, technically, all submission. Everton Escudero catches yeah. him in a standing guillotine. What, 58 seconds in the round? Don't like that. Live obey Mercier. He gives him a go. He hurts Mercier. He gets taken down. He gets submitted. Leandro and of course, Silva, the... Leandro Silva. Osiris Maya absolutely butchered in, that one. Though. In Brazil, like, that was terrible a, call. That was a screw job. Terrible call. But again, Technically speaking, actually, that's a no contest. I'm at a loss. But you know, uh, at the moment of the fight, it was. If you had bet on Leandro Silva, you won that night. It's yeah, just like yeah. they, they got. They, by the time they overturned it, we're your not talking in about account. overturning. It doesn't really matter. That night, you lose your money. That's all that I'm really saying. Matters. I'm saying it, at, this is low level fight. It's not like he's fighting a high end guy. So, low level fight, it's like, okay, we're looking at what's being given to us. The submission, that could be an issue. But John Tuck has not taken an opponent down since 2014 yeah. when he took down Jake Lindsay. He doesn't have ring IQ, doesn't have a good game plan. He relies on the fact that he probably knows he hits pretty hard. And at a, he's out at Alliance MMA. You'd think he'd be more willing to wrestle. You'd think he'd be more willing to go out there with a game plan and stick to it. But he just doesn't. He's super untrustworthy. And I got to go with Drew Dober. Drew Dober landed 145 significant strikes his last fight against Frank Camacho. He was taken down three times against Frank Camacho. But he's good enough now, hopefully, to get back up. And when he does get back up, pour the pressure on you. That's the way to beat John Tuck. Again, the minus 210, I really don't love it, but I understand it. The 8900... I really think this fight's going the distance, and I think that there's better options on Minus the card. Minus 175 for this fight to go to the distance. 
go to decision. Yeah, so I, I'm not like feeling pretty Dober wide, unless... especially if you're paying up. When we talk about other people in that price range, obviously the Calderwood fight is minus 400. Go to decision. It's a women's fight. That's just the way the market is dictated these days. Fair. Um, when we were talking about Sandhag, and that was basically a pick. I mean, this one's minus 175, so it's way more likely to go to decision you than know what? the Sandhag and Alcantara fight. I, I agree, but with Sandhagen. You know, if it goes the distance, could get the points on the volume. With Calderwood, we truly believe this is going the distance. It's going to have to yeah. get the points on the volume. He's the same way. I see the fight going the distance, and he needs the volume. And whereas he did have 145's last fight, and this is a very similar matchup, he could get it. Small shares on him. If I'm playing 10 teams, Dober's on two of them at least. But he doesn't traditionally do that very consistently. So maybe don't put all your eggs in one basket with Drew Dober. And again, you know, the submission could theoretically be there. But I think Drew Dober is one of the safer picks on the card, and I'm going to be playing him. Fair enough. We got uh, Ronnie Yaya taking on Luke Sanders. Ronnie Yaya, 8,300 in DraftKings, minus 120 favorite. Luke Sanders is 7,900 and plus 110. Fight goes to decision, plus 120. Mm, mm. Bantamweight fight that uh, has a plus... For it to not go to, or it's, yeah, it's plus money for it to go to decision. It's minus money. So they're thinking finish. And this is actually the fight on the card that I was kind of most interested in talking about. Because Luke Sanders seems to have all the skills. As you always say, he's cool hand Luke. He's so cool. cool. Hand Luke. He's so cool. Barely he's got some Patrick power. Williams. He's got some power in his hands. He's, he gets knockdowns. Yeah. He has potential to score really high. But he is such a bed shitter. He shits the bed more mm -hmm. than anybody. Mm -hmm. He'll be winning that fight. He's like Scoggins. And you know how much that pains me to say. But Scoggins is winning the fight up until he loses it. Same thing with Luke San Sanders. He, everything is kind of going his way, and then he'll shit the bed. He'll, mm -hmm. he'll screw up. He'll let his opponent, you know, Sukumantov, knock him out. And, <sighs> And, like after he was he was dominating, and then Uriel Cantera was like Uriel Cantera was getting absolutely murked by him, and then he, he finds a way. Ronnie Yaya doesn't have oh, the greatest man. wrestling, but he is very very slick and smart when he gets to the ground, Super and slick. he is not above just like trying to pull guard or weaseling his way into a uh, into a grappling exchange along the fence, falling to your ankle, trying to grasp at ankles. Back tick, These body are... lock, ride your back for the whole round. Yes. Like, Son of a bitch. And that's one of the things. Yeah, like, Ronnie does Sanders, it. I really like as a draft king, as a GPP play, don't play this guy in cash because he will screw the like he will screw the pooch. And more often than not, I think he's the better all-around fighter. I think we have seen Ronnie Yaya when he struggled. Is like guys that can really, really put the heat on him on the feet. I think Sanders has all the ability to do it. It's tough to trust him though, and that's the biggest issue here because like he he could 100% again like get like two knockdowns in the first round. He's looking great, and then just like end up in a an exchange along the fence and get screwed. And um, so it's like he's a he's a he's a DraftKings GPP type of play. I actually like him in a GPP type of situation, but uh, boy oh boy, if I'm gonna sit here and say I'm confident that he does it, I'd be lying to you. I can't you, you can't you can't really trust in him to do it anymore. Yeah, listen, I mean, <laughs> you know how I feel about Luke Sanders. Luke Sanders screws me in other ways, you know, because because he's like Andrew Sanchez to me. He's got all the parts. Guy can wrestle. The guy can strike. The guy's got it on the regional scene. And you know what? I give them the tag of my boy. You know, hey, Luke Sanders, my boy. Andrew Sanchez, this guy's my boy. So I take them aside and says, hey guys, you're my boy. I'm gonna let you in a little secret. Got this nice little apple pie here. <laughs> mm, this is a nice, tasty apple pie. Mom been working on this one all night. Cinnamon, brown sugar. Mm, this thing's almost just about ready to come out of the oven. And these fucking bastards shit in it, right? I've had the pie shit in by both of them many of times. Luke Sanders, he's killing Alcantara. Alcantara's going to the hospital one way or another. It's the fact, it's not that he was a fluke submission, because it wasn't. It was the like most. A lapse in judgment. It was lapse the most attention. predictable setup for a knee bar of all times. Y you saw it coming a mile away. I was screaming at the TV as it was happening, and he just tapped out. You know what? It probably hurt a lot. Sukman tapped. Watch the fight with my dad. I tell my dad, this is a bad game plan. He should take him down. My dad says, why? He's beating him standing. Yeah. He wins the first round standing in Sukhman Tath. He beats him in the striking belt. But Sukhman Tath is one dimensional. He can only strike. So why would you play his game when you can just take him down? Gets caught. 
Another lapse in judgment. Okay. Patrick Williams. I bet everything I have, baby. <laughs> Let's roll it. How is he going to lose to Patrick Williams, who gives him a fight, gives him a real fight, and he wins a decision, and that's fine. The fact that you couldn't finish Patrick Williams, who's known to gas and is known to get super susceptible and in the later Sanders rounds. Sanders was like 9,200, or he was over 9,000 on DraftKings that oh, week. Like He was shit. a big favorite. He was supposed to deliver, and he was he was like the chalk bomb. Yeah, you and imagine I mean? imagine you looked at that fight strictly on numbers, okay? Because he won the decision. I think we're not arguing that, right? No. Patrick Williams outstruck him sixty-one to fifty-nine, and Patrick Williams scored the lone takedown it was in dicey, that fight for sure. Right, dicey with Patrick Williams. That's a red flag. So how can I now trust this guy against Ronnie Yaya? Because yeah, Ronnie Yaya is better grappler than Yuri Alcantara. He's former 2003. I realized it's a long time ago, but we know how good he is. He's a former ADCC champion. His, his, his grappling is top notch. If he can't just flat out submit you the way he can take out a guy, lower end guys like Henry Briones, he's going to eat these guys up. But the upper echelon guys, if he can't submit you, he's just going to win a positional battle against you, man. He'll get takedowns somehow. If he doesn't get takedowns, he'll flop around until he finds a moment to take your back. Once he takes your back, you're not getting him off of you. If he's on top, you're not getting back up. Nobody gets back up when this guy's on top of you. you got to stuff the takedowns. Sanders has got the wrestling. He should be able to stuff the takedowns and beat Ronnie Yaya standing. But part of you goes back time and time again to the fact that this guy makes poor decisions. And a poor decision against Ronnie Yaya is a bad spot to be in. Ronnie Yaya is the least sexiest guy in the UFC. I'm not talking about appearance-wise, which he ranks up there anyhow. <laughs> but the fights are very dog, dog shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he, maybe he finishes you. Okay. You're a lower echelon fighter. You know, it's shockingly enough, he's actually got a... He's on a great run. He's like a 6-6-1 six, six and one in his last seven in the yeah. UFC. I can't take that away from him. Most of those guys have since been released from their UFC contracts. But again, he's going out there. He's beating guys. He has a win over my boy, Johnny Bedford. Uh, he's really all not all that bad. He's like a fine wine at 33. You think he's so much older than that. But at 33, it's like he knows what he's doing. He's been doing this his entire adult life. And he finds ways to get the victory. But... I have not gone against Luke Sanders yet, and this will not be the first time. The minus 120, or sorry, the dog. Fact that he's not really a dog. He's plus 100. It's pretty much even. The 7900, don't really love it on DraftKings. I, I, I could find myself using it as some, uh, you know, some, some, some cap relief, so to speak, some salary relief. But at the same time, I think he's got to do against Ronnie Yaya exactly what Joe Soto did against Ronnie Yaya. I'm a better wrestler than you. You cannot take me down. We're going to stand. You are when we're pretty standing, bad standing. I'm going to batter you. I'm just going to batter you. And I know we've said this all the time, but if I was to put you on the spot, let's say this is a street, I romped you a Paul Shaughnessy, okay? You've got, uh, we're going to put in Warley Alves. We're going to put in Andrew Sanchez. We're going to put in John Tuck and Ronnie Yaya. Who's got the worst gas tank? Ronnie Yaya does not have cardio. He beats you on two rounds and loses the third. Mm -hmm. His fight with Masanori Kanahara was so aggravating because he flops like a bitch because he knows he's won two rounds. This is how he can grind out guys that he can't just flat out submit. Maybe he can submit Luke Sanders. We've seen Sanders get submitted by lesser opponents. Maybe he can. But for my money's worth, I think Sanders keeps the fight standing, uses the wrestling, which we saw against Pat Williams. Pat Williams is a freak athlete. Pat Williams is a former you know, D1 wrestling standout. Pat Williams can wrestle. He stuffed those takedowns against him. Stuffed the takedowns against Ronnie Yaya and picked this guy apart. And, and that's the way that he can get the job done. I know you said you'd like him more on GPP than cash. I agree with that assessment in that he seems like a risky play, so why would you want him on cash? But I don't like him on GPP because I think the way to beat Yaya is be smart and don't go balls out. You be could smart. just get like a bunch of knockdown bonuses because Yaya just flops to his back every time he gets hit. You know when DraftKings, and I love DraftKings, they're not going to score that a knockdown. Well, it's on DraftKings that does it. It's fight metric. Fair. Score. All I'm saying is how many times have we seen knockdowns well, uh, not get scored uh, as knockdowns? Josh Emmett versus Arantius. There was like four knockdowns credited in that, and like at least two of them. It was just like, no, Arantius is just trying to fall to his back so that he can maybe get one of his uh, triangle triangle chokes from bottom. Yeah, we've seen it before. Guys that are that much better on the ground, they don't care. They'll just throw some hot shit. They throw a lot of kicks standing because ultimately, what are you going to do? Catch a kick and follow me to the ground? What are you going to do, right? I don't mind being on my back. But when it's like a push, I don't know. They don't really count it as a clean knockout. So essentially what we're saying here is we're grabbing our apple pies. We're putting it up near the, wind, uh, the mm -hmm. windowsill. Yeah. We're just hoping. We're, we're, we're praying that there isn't a toilet nearby and... 
Luke Sanders just happens to miss that toilet and shit in our apple pie. Uh huh. Yeah, because again, it's not even that he has a history of shit in the apple pie, but it's all the the pie is so much worse when it's the first bite of the card and it's <laughs> yeah. somebody shit. Here my it. And you my know night's what? over. You know Anders shit in the pie when he fought Machida for me, but it was the main event. Hedge opportunities were left, right, and center. This is not a hedge opportunity, and I am playing Luke Sanders. He is going to be on some of my parlays. Risky. Yes. No risk, no reward. He's even money. This is a card that I don't like a ton of underdogs, but I like a lot of even money fights. And that's going to give me lots of value if I can string them together properly and find certain spots. So I've been on a roll and let's keep the good times rolling. However, I fully acknowledge that this is a tough card, man. This is definitely a tough card. Because the guy that you're just like, oh, I really like before the odds came out. Oh, I really like this guy. And she's like, oh, he's juiced to the tits. So... Where is the value? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's about picking a few little, um, a few little spots along the way. Like we both liked Luke San- Sanders, uh, Figueredo Moraga going to decision. Don't hate that. At minus the, those decision props are nice. You get some minus forty on fights to go the distance that appear like they're going to go the distance. You're going to get a couple wrong here and there, but as a result, you can make that profitable. Mm, yeah. I think I'm going to take a, a decent amount of overs on this card. Any other uh, final thoughts here before we uh, wrap her up? I don't know how long we've been going for. It feels like a long time. but about an hour and a half. Uh, just happy to be back, man. Honestly, yeah. this is what we do best. I uh, miss seeing your mug and uh, your much thinner mug, may I add. And uh, yeah, keep the good you, times rolling. Lost, you shedded some LBs as well. Yeah, because it's so fucking hot outside. I'm sweating. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. That's the Canadian way is that we all lose the weight when it's the summer and then winter. We got to pack it down. We go into hibernation mode up here. All right. uh, That more or less wraps it up for us this week. I want to thank Cody Saftik for uh, breaking down the fights with me and getting back into the gears here. I want to thank Chad Dow, our producer. Stock is rising on Chad Dow uh, for... Cody and Chad, I am Paul saying goodbye and good luck. Experience! Experience!